And hello, soon we'll be starting this week's episode of Developers Let's Code. Welcome to any of you joining me here today. We'll be starting Let's Code soon. Who's out there? Where are you watching from? We'd love to hear from you. My name is John. I'm streaming from Sydney, Australia. We'll shortly be starting Developers Let's Code. Today we'll be concentrating on Compute as our platform. Last week we had a look at S3. The idea of this show is to provide a, hey Mexico, hey Cause Mix, hey Cause MX. Uh, the idea of the show is uh, maybe you're a developer who's uh, new to AWS and you're not quite sure how all of this works. So uh, each week we'll be focusing on a different bit of AWS such as Compute, serverless, containers, databases, and showing you how to use the services. Just get you over that hump of not quite understanding uh, how things work. Hey, Emily from Melbourne. Is that a warm hello from Melbourne? Is Melbourne that warm at the moment? Um, we're just coming out of winter. I don't know Melbourne normally being that, that warm. I'm streaming from Sydney, Australia. So uh, welcome to all of you coming online. By all means, let me know where you're coming from. Uh, it's uh, 11 a.m. for me here in Sydney. But I'm sure we have some people from all around the world joining us here today. Uh, while we're waiting for the show to begin, it's worth mentioning um, last week we had, uh, no, this week, this is today, uh, we're looking at provisioning virtual servers to host your app in the cloud. Hey, Jelly, welcome back. Uh, next week we'll be looking at uh, Lambda. Uh, Lambda is wonderful. It's this strange concept that you would never have come up yourself, but it's a way of running code and we take care of all of the, the server size so it's called serverless so we'll be having a look at uh, lambda and things you might be able to do with it uh we'll be skipping the week after because there's another online event but uh, then we'll be returning on the 26th of august uh looking at uh security and uh, we'd like to say security is number one we didn't start with security that would confuse people but we'll certainly be jumping into uh, security topics so brad's welcome Oh my, David Reedy, welcome aboard. I saw your message to me on on Twitch, uh, on Twitter, sorry, I just saw it the other day and I didn't get to respond to you. So uh, good to see you're still around and welcome to the cloud era. Um, so uh, D Reedy there in the chat uh, used to be with me in the Apple Users Group Sydney. Wonder how much there is online about those old days. I was a, uh, a, uh, oh, was a Mac user group. Um, I found a website recently, somebody had put all the disks from the old Apple II user group back then. So yes, we were using the Apple II and eventually the Mac came along, so that was quite fun. Where can you see the online events other than this one? So um, uh, Twitch uh, has a schedule down the bottom if you, um, you might have a link that allows you to see our schedule or you can just go to twitch.tv slash AWS slash schedule. You'll see the various shows that we have on board there. And also we have a web page on the AWS website where a lot of our video shows are listed. We see the online events other than this one. So next, uh, in two weeks, there'll be an online event called uh, Container Day, which I think is being run out of Korea and they'll be using the Twitch channel. But uh, let's get started on this. So welcome everyone to, uh, hey John, does the security one involve IAM? Yes, IAM is all about uh, security, being able to allocate permissions to your users. So join us for that episode when we look at um, the cloud security fundamentals and we'll look at things like um, IAM, the Identity Access Management, um, Bucket Polys is in S3 and general things that you should do to keep your system secure. You know, that alone is a major topic you can uh, cover off there. But I have an hour to get through the fundamentals of EC2. So let's begin. Uh, what is EC2? EC2 is a virtual computer in the cloud. Uh, you want uh, another machine to run your accounting system, your web server, a database, no need to buy hardware anymore. You can just go and uh, use an online system. And the great thing is you can spin it up online. When you don't need it, you can turn it off and you only pay as you go. So that's the big thing about the cloud. You only pay for things you need as you go. Also, you don't have to predict your usage. If suddenly tomorrow you have a big sale on and you need more machines, you can turn on more machines, you can change the size of machines, etc. But enough talk, let's play, because I always find the best way to play around is to um, do it. So hopefully you have an EC2, uh, an AWS account. If you go to the EC2 console, you'll be bombarded with all of these strange words. So hopefully uh, you'll understand a lot of these once we finish today. 
I'm going to jump down to instances and hit this big friendly blue button to launch an instance because the best way to understand things is to launch an EC2 instance. The first question that comes up when you launch an EC2 instance is what Amazon machine image you want to use or an AMI it's called. And this is a copy of the boot disk for your instance. So when you launch the machine, it has to have a boot disk. Maybe it's got Linux, Ubuntu, uh, Windows on there. Maybe it's got all of your software and your data already loaded and configured. So this is your opportunity to uh, say, please boot up a machine with this disk. So here in the console, we have something called Quick Start, where we have lots of different um, images for you. Uh, Amazon Linux, which is our version of Linux, which has lots of things preloaded for you. Uh, Red Hat. SUSE and Ubuntu, so many different flavors of Linux, but we don't just do Linux, we also do Microsoft Windows, um, huge workloads of Microsoft Windows on AWS. And uh, we've got deep learning AMIs, if you're doing a lot of uh, machine learning type things, these AMIs come pre-configured with all of these fancy words I can't pronounce, CUDA, DNN, NCSL, machine uh, data scientists would understand it, I'm sure. And if we go down here, you'll see even more Windows servers um, with containers. This one here, if you boot this one up, it comes with SQL Server installed up and running for you. And the hourly cost of the instance even includes the cost of, um, of uh, that SQL Server. Hello, Pescatariat. Welcome. Uh, uh, everyone, you're welcome to say where you're coming from. And I'll give you a shout out on the call. This is live coming to you from Sydney, Australia. So you have lots of different AMIs here that you can just choose. Oh, you can create your own AMI. So you might boot up a machine, load all your favorite software, get it going exactly the way you want. And then you can create what's called a disk image of that. You can create your own AMI so you can boot up future machines pre-configured with that software. Or there is the AWS Marketplace. And the AWS Marketplace is where third parties sell pre-configured AMIs, pre-configured disk images, Fairfax. Hey, fantastic. Um, you can load pre-configured disk images of your favorite software. For example, uh, if I want to install a firewall, firewalls are complex things, I don't want to make it myself. You could get uh, Fortinet uh, from 30 cents an hour, all pre-configured, all loaded, Palo Alto, uh, Barracuda. So uh, lots of pre-configured systems for you. and makes it so easy to launch your systems and get them up and going. And finally down here we have community AMIs. This is where anyone, including you, can make a disk image and share it with other people. Maybe you're selling some software and you want people to try your software. You could create an AMI, pre-configure it with um, uh, the software that's installed on it, and then people can just simply launch a new machine and start playing with your software. Ah, Cold Melbourne, Clitch JD. Well, I'll try and warm you up with my insightful comments about EC2. How's that? Uh, let's go to, why is nothing showing there? I will launch a new instance from here. I'm going to choose Amazon Linux, which is a good standard. Uh, you'll see we support both x86 and ARM processors. Some EC2 instances support ARM chipsets. So we chose a boot disk. Second step, choose an instance type. And this is asking you to choose the virtual hardware for your virtual machine. And for this, I've got a few things to explain. In fact, I have a slide that I prepared here earlier. Oh, that's not the one I wanted to show. I want to go into, oh yes, we'll go into this, fantastic. So uh, this is a picture sort of behind the scenes in AWS. So we have huge numbers of machines out there. Uh, anyone know how many servers we have in AWS? Put your, put your guess in the chat. We'll see if you get it right. Uh, we have lots and lots of machines running uh, for you to use. But um, rather than having to use the whole machine, we use a hypervisor to divide that machine into smaller bits. So uh, down the bottom here, the machine has lots and lots of CPU. It has lots and lots of RAM. But when you, depending on the instance size that you launch, 2,000, oh, we've got more servers than 2,000. Um, 1. 1.4 million could be. Uh, the correct answer is apparent one server. Uh, the correct answer is lots of servers. And um, I don't know how many lots is, but hey, they look like this. We divide each server, big servers, lots of CPU, lots of RAM, we divide them into smaller bits. So um, for this particular instance, a virtual machine we call an EC2 instance, we give you a certain amount of RAM, a certain amount of CPU, and a certain amount of attached disk. And you can then launch that machine and use that machine. So on that host computer, we're actually running many 
different people's machines, but you wouldn't even notice it. There's no way for them to see what you're doing in your computer. They can't take your RAM, they can't take your CPU. Uh, also attached to that, we have networking that goes out to talk to the internet, S3 uh, and many other things. I'll come back to this slide a little bit later. So here on the console, it's saying, what instance type do you want to launch? And I should give you a link here, put this in chat. Uh, this is a listing of all of our different instance types because it can be quite confusing to, uh, to understand all our different instance types. And for example, I'm going to launch with a T2 instance, which is a burstable system. It means uh, you can burst higher than usual and get extra CPU. We've also got our M series, which are our general purpose instances. And we tell you exactly which chipsets, etc., you have in here. And the easiest way to understand it is by looking at this table on the page here. First of all, we have the instance family. So here we have our T2s or T3s or M5s. That's when you go to that page and have a look. What's the capability? What sort of processor does it have? Uh, some of them have uh, GPUs. So you could even go in and say, oh, I want to have accelerated computing with um, NVIDIA GPUs to do lots of uh, uh, complex calculations, etc. So you choose a family, and within the family, you then have these different sizes of instances, nano, micro, small, medium. And the thing you'll notice is as you go up in size, it also goes up in terms of CPU. So a small has one CPU, a medium has two, uh, extra large has four, etc. It keeps going up, and the RAM keeps going up as well. So if you want a bigger machine, just choose a larger instance type. You get both more CPUs and more RAM running in there. Uh, every server partitions into smaller servers, right? So, uh, Pescateria, so when you look at the machines, you just see a machine. You don't need to know what's behind the scenes, but I can tell you, if you go for an instance type, the biggest instance type uh, within a family, so I might choose the uh, M5, our general purpose machines, and you can see the biggest type out here is an M5 24X large. That's what they've named it. It's got 96 CPUs, 384 uh, gigs of RAM. So a uh, very big machine. Um, if you don't want that one, you can choose one that is say half the size and it's got half the number of CPUs, half the number of uh, amount of RAM. When you see that machine though, it's got that size, you don't even know you're running on half of a bigger machine. All of that is hidden from you. So very similar to VMware type things, except we use a hypervisor called the Zen hypervisor. And more recently, AWS has invented its own hypervisor called Nitro. There's one that goes up to 768 gig. Oh, there's some huge machines out here. Um, the biggest ones are the X series. This has two terabytes of memory on it, which is just in, oh, no, look at this. Oh my gosh. That's almost four terabytes of memory on one machine. Uh, huge amounts of networking, etc. So massive machines that you can do. <laughs> That's not too much. That's plenty. So you choose an instance type. You get a certain amount of CPU. You get a certain amount of memory. Um, the bigger the machine, the faster you're networking. Because going back to this slide, if you have um, lots of machines running on the one host, we have to divide that network up to several of those computers. So if you have a big instance, maybe you're the only one running on that whole host, you get all the networking. If there's only two of you running, you each get half. So as we divide up the machine smaller and smaller, you get a slightly smaller slice of that networking. And that's what this column says about network performance. The smaller ones might have low to moderate, through to moderate, and then they get bigger and bigger, five gigs, 10 gigs, even 20 and 25 gigs uh, for your network bandwidth. The only place in the whole of AWS that we throttle your bandwidth is based on your EC2 instance size. Everything else that passes through the network goes at full speed if possible. So um, I might come in here and say, oh, I would like a, uh, I'll go for a micro instance. It's available in our free usage tier, I should point out, What's meant by our free tier? Maybe you're new to AWS, you want to try some things, you're a bit worried, you don't want to, want to spend some money. You can take advantage of our free tier. It's automatic when you create a new AWS account. And in here we show you what you get. So in the case of EC2, whoop, don't click that, I shall go back to the previous screen. Uh, EC2 for the first 12 months of your account, we give you 750 hours per month of Linux and 750 hours per month of Windows if you run on a micro sized instance. So uh, if we look at that list I had up here before, a micro instance, one CPU, 
a uh, gig of memory, it's enough to sort of play around and get going. I certainly wouldn't run production systems on this. Uh, bleep bleep blam asks, uh, what do we consider low to moderate speeds? We don't actually publish exactly what speeds we mean here, but you can by all means run some tests and see the network throughput that's there. I was doing something one time where I had to download lots of data from the internet, and I did notice that these smaller instance types were visibly slower than some of the larger instance types. So if you're sending down, uh, uploading or downloading large amounts of data, go for the larger instance types. It's the best thing to do. How many hours are there in the month? That's very clever of you to figure out. So let's say we have a 30 day month, 24 hours a day. There are 720 hours in a month. So this basically says, yep, you can run a Windows and a Linux instance for the whole month and that will fit within the free tier. And uh, so when I'm launching my instance here, you'll see it says free tier eligible. So I'll go for that one. You can do that from home as well. It means you can run both Windows and Linux. Yes, you can run a Windows one and a Linux one for the whole month. Or you could run two machines for half a month because we only calculate the number of hours you run. You could run 10 machines for a tenth of the month uh, as long as uh, you, you just get the first 750 hours for free. And it's not expensive. Uh, I'll show you the pricing later on. So I've told it what boot disk to use, what virtual hardware to give me. And I go next. Uh, is network out also on the free tier? Uh, network out is always free. Uh, sorry, network in is always free. Network out, uh, there is a amount of free data you can get. Uh, it's like the first gig is free of your data transfer. So if you're just playing around, uh, you should go just fine there. I hit the back button, did I? Linux. Next. Okay, now we get to this configure screen. There's lots of options here. I don't want to spend too much time going through it, but you can basically say which virtual network you want to launch in. Will it go in my production network? Will it go in my dev test network? Uh, so you can create all those networks, public subnets, private subnets, etc. You can associate a role, and a role allows you to give permissions to the applications running on that EC2 instance. So if your applications have to go out and let's say access S3, they can use the permissions granted by this role. You'll learn more about that in our security episode. Um, and another thing I want to point out here is this concept of tenancy. So flicking back to this slide, uh, if you launch an instance, you might be sharing some uh, resources on that machine with somebody else, some other company running resources on here. We keep your data private, we keep your CPU private, we don't think you'll be interfered by anything, but sometimes companies are working under certain security regulations, maybe health protocols or government top secret things, and they're saying, nope, I need that machine to be my own machine. Then you can come in here and, and use what's called a dedicated instance. And when you run a dedicated instance, only instances from your AWS account will run on that host. We might mix dedicated and non-dedicated, but only your account will be running on that hardware so no one else can interfere. We also have something called a dedicated host, which is bigger. That's where you can choose the whole host computer itself. And it's really useful for things like software licensing, where um, certain large uh, database companies like to charge based on the number of CPUs in a machine. So you choose that sort of thing and put all of your databases on there. But normally, it should be uh, just fine to use shared infrastructure. Um, get the first gigabyte free every month jelly. Thank you very much. So you get a gig of data. I'll explain that later. Um, I'm going to point out a very useful thing here, and this is called user data. And user data is the ability to pass information to your EC2 instance. And one thing you can pass to it is a script. So I have a very simple little uh, script here for Linux. And uh, what it does is it does some updates to my computer, installs an Apache web server, turns it on, and just creates a text file in the uh, the website directory. And so I'm just going to use this to demonstrate that you can install software on your EC2 when you launch the instance. So I'm just going to paste that in. And because it starts with this hash bang, it will execute um, automatically on when your instance starts up for the first time. It'll install the first time you run, but it doesn't have to reinstall every time you go through there. So we chose a disk. We chose the virtual hardware. We choose networking, various settings that you want in here. Uh, next, storage. Uh, when you run an EC2 instance, here's my picture, uh, we attach this EBS thing, and it stands for Elastic Block Store. Think of it as a USB disk. Uh, just like at home, you can plug a USB disk into a computer. You can use the disk. You can then unplug it from that computer, plug it into a different computer. 
Same thing with uh, Amazon EBS. It's our uh, SAN, no, it's it's SAN or NAS, I was going to SAN storage. It's a virtual disk that is network attached. And that's going to be your boot disk, your data disk, etc. We also have another thing called ephemeral storage, which is a temporary disk that's attached to your machine. Just think of it as a scratch disk or a, 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 an extra drive. And um, any, but anything you put on there is not retained. I won't go too heavily on that. But anything on EBS will be kept for you so you can turn off your machine and it's available for you again when you turn it back on later. So you can come in here and say, I would like my disk to be ooh, 20 gig. You can always change the size of your disk later. There's also different options of how fast those disks will go. Uh, don't have time for the moment. Let's get launching our instance. I'll explain it later. And you can also say whether to delete that disk. When you launch an instance and you no longer want any more, you can terminate that instance. Should you keep the disk or you can throw away the disk as well. Tags, always useful to uh, track what is happening on your instance. I will call this my web server. You can also add other tags in here, like you might be able to say, oh, the department is finance, my project code is A123. Um, and these can be used for billing, so you can get a billing breakdown uh, based upon your tags for the instance. Security, we all love security. This is where you get to say, what is allowed to connect into this server? So I'm gonna create a security group called my web server. Being a web server, I can come in here and say, I want to add a rule and I want to allow HTTP traffic, which will come on port 80. And I can say from anywhere on the internet, from my IOP address, whatever, websites like to be accessible on the internet. So I'm just going to say, hey, um, that can come from anywhere. I'm also allowing SSH. So this is a Linux instance. I will SSH in. We'll do a Windows instance after. Um, but I want to lock down for security. So I'm going to say, only my current IP address can log into that instance, so none of you will be able to. <laughs> and I go and launch my instance. The final question asked when I launch an instance is to choose a key pair. And uh, I shall explain what a key pair means. So um, when you launch an EC2 Linux instance, you log into it, if you want to SSH into it, using a key pair. A key pair is a, a public-private key pair using RSA technology. If you don't understand that, don't worry. You can create one in here. Uh, so I'm going to call this uh, Let's Code. And you can download a PEM file. Or if you're a Windows user who uses PuTTY to do SSH, you can download that too. I will say create a key pair. It then downloads for me uh, my private key. And I can use that private key to log into instances later uh, if I wish. And only people with that private key will be able to log in. Windows is slightly different. So I look at my various uh, servers that I've got here. And we just launched. You'll notice they're in different states. We'll cover this in a moment. Running, stopped, terminated, what they mean. Here's my web server. It's uh, up and running. Uh, there are some status checks going on. So EC2 checks, is that hardware working well? Is it all running OK? And because I installed a web server on there, I'm going to grab the IP address of this server, the public IP address of the server, open up a new tab and paste in. And here you'll see um, my little script that I installed when that server started. I'll show you the script again. It said, uh, hello world from EC2 instance, insert host name. And indeed it did. So this is a web server running on my EC2 instance. Just in the time that I spoke to you, it launched, installed the Apache web server and start her running. Uh, while we're doing this, let's also launch a Windows one because Windows is slightly different the way it works. So I'll launch a Windows 2019. I'm going to choose a bit of a, a bigger instance because we all know that Windows loves lots of memory and things. And I will... Don't need any additional storage. Let's give it a name. The name will appear in the first column of your dashboard. So this will be my Win 2019 instance. By default, it's going to allow RDP to let me uh, log into that particular instance. And I will go ahead and launch that instance. And we'll come back to that a little bit later because Windows takes a bit of time to spin up. Is the name key case sensitive? Oh, that's interesting. Let's have a look. Brad's. So if I was to try and create a new key pair with let's code. Uh, the key pair exists, so uh, it looks like the names for key pairs are insensitive. The name itself doesn't actually matter. It's the contents of the key pair that's the main thing. 
and um, we'll see how that works. Also, my EC2 instance lets me log into the instance. So let's have a look. This is my web server instance. If I click on it, I get a whole lot of information about the instance. I get a unique ID so I can refer to it later. I get my IP address. Uh, later we'll cover um, networking on another show and we'll explain the difference between public IP addresses, private IP addresses, etc. But this is the IP address I can use to get into my machine. I can see my web server, sorry, my security group that was configured on here that said it is happy to uh, allow incoming traffic on port 80 for the web server and port 22 for SSH. Let's try that. Let's try connecting into my uh, system. So I could say SSH into that IP address and it will reject me because I haven't authenticated. So um, I've got to provide a key pair and that would be in my key pair file here and then I can say log in as EC2 user on that particular machine and bang I'm in. So EC2 hyphen user is the default um, name of the user you get on an EC2 instance. And this is now just the normal EC2 instance. Uh, thanks Jelly for uh, answering questions there in the chat for me as well. And it's a perfectly normal uh, Linux instance that you can use and, and get going. The trick I'll just explain is when you nominate a key pair when you launch the instance, there is a SSH directory here on the machine. So if I go into SSH and have a look at what's in there, there is a file called authorize keys. And this is the public half of my key pair. It's okay for people to see that. It's the public half of my key pair. When I logged in, I provided the private half of my key pair and that allowed me to log into the instance. So very easy and quick to get uh, an instance up and going. Let's see if I can do the same for a Windows instance here. So here is my Windows instance I launched. I'll grab the IP address. Now, Windows does not use key pairs. So when you want to log into it, uh, connect to it the first time, you use this function called get Windows password. And it's saying, ah, a default password for administrator was created when the instance was launched and it's been encrypted. And to decrypt it, you have to provide your private key pair. So the same key pair that I used earlier, I can just come in here and say, please decrypt it. And bang, it's now saying that uh, this instance can be accessed. Now, any of you out there can access this instance, so it could be very dangerous. And because I'm showing my password, so I'm actually gonna protect this by changing the security group that I used. And I'm gonna edit that and say, oh, only I can get into that system. So even though you saw my password up there temporarily, only I can get in or anyone from my particular network. Let's give it a go here. You can just use a remote desktop or any of your um, RDP type tools. And oh, I might edit this one. So, my machine name was this. Save that, log into it. Here's the password that you could try and use, but you can't get into my machine because I locked it down by security group. And then I am in on my Windows machine that takes a few minutes to start up. So just as easy, launch in a machine, decode that password, the administrator password. After that, we recommend that you change the administrator password, make it part of your Active Directory domain, do what your company's standard security is to make sure you have a secure machine that is out there. Okay, uh, what else did I want to show here? So when launching an instance, this is a bit of an overview of the things that you do for it. You tell it which, oops, you tell it which disk image you want to go on there, that AMI, it might be Linux, it might be Windows, it might be one you created yourself. You tell it what networking you want to associate with it. Should it go in my public subnet, private subnet, developer network, production network? You choose the disk access that you want. How big the disk should be? How many disks do you want on there? Should the disk be kept around when you throw away the instance? We had that user data which allows you to um, pass information down the instance and it can be a script. You define the security groups, what ports do you allow from what IP address ranges, 
and you specify the key pair that allows you to log into the instance. So that's a bit of an overview. Here's some examples of some user data. So in this case, this is some user data uh, for Linux that would, looks like it would install uh, PHP in a web server, turn things on. There's also another way um, that you can specify in YAML format what should be installed on there. If you are Windows people, you can similarly provide a DOS script or a PowerShell script to get running uh, with your EC2 instance. Okay. Um, IP address security groups. So in the listing here, I'm going to mention that all of these different instance states, what does stopped started running and all this sort of thing mean? So I can point to uh, the Windows instance that we just launched, and I've got a few commands up here. I can change the instance state. So if I no longer want the machine, maybe it's being used by developers, and I can turn the machine off at night. When they come in the next morning at 9 a.m., they developers, 10 a.m., they can uh, turn it on again. So I can come in here and I can say, I want to stop that instance. That sends a uh, ACPI, I think it is, the, the power down signal to your computer, just like pressing the power button on the front of your computer, and it says, computer, please power off. So it does a nice, graceful shutdown of the machine. And uh, a number of seconds later, that machine will be stopped, and you no longer need to pay for the instance. So the best tip I can give you to save money on EC2, turn things off that you don't need. You pay for them when they're on, when they're stopped, you don't pay for the machine itself. You might pay for the attached disk storage because we keep that for you, but no charge for the EC2 instance itself. And here it is, uh, that particular uh, web server, oh, it's not my Windows one, it's my web server, is now stopped. So if I tried to connect to it, uh, I couldn't because it turned off. Can you set the start stop time automatically or do we need to do it manually every time? So. Everything you do in AWS, you can do in three ways. You can use a management console like I'm showing you now. You can use a command line or you can do things programmatically. So I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, you saw before when I went in and I created a key pair. Where's my key pairs? So I created this let's code key pair through the console and it gave me a key. I could similarly uh, do this from the command line. So I can say AWS EC2 create key pair and I don't know what the next command is so it will prompt me I have to provide a key name so I want to create a key name which I'll call CLI and bang it comes up with my private key my top secret private key please don't memorize it and if I go back to the console here and refresh uh, you'll see that a CLI has been generated so you can do things through the console you can do things from the command line you can also do things uh, programmatically, I have a script here on a machine. Um, I can't remember what I called it. It is uh, create key pair. This is a, a bit of old Python. In fact, it's so old. Um, we have a newer version of Boto here. But basically, this little script simply says uh, connect to EC2. I'm running in the Sydney region. Uh, create a key pair called Python and then print the result. So if I run this little script here, it's done exactly the same thing. It connected to EC2, it created the key pair, it printed the result up here, and I can go back to the console and I have my Python key pair. So the thing to get out of this is, well, that is old Python. Yes, if you if you look at my uh, my scripts that I have here, I actually wrote them back in 2016. So I've got to update them to uh, Python 3 and Boto 3. Uh, so I just want to demonstrate here, everything you do in AWS, you can do through the console. You can do from a command line, so you can script it out in PowerShell or um, Linux, whatever. Uh, or you can do it programmatically. So to answer the question from Emily, can you start stop the time automatically? There are some tools in AWS that can help you do so. Uh, let's go to our CloudWatch service, which is normally used for monitoring your EC2 instances, which I would definitely uh, want to show you. And I have a, a thing in here called CloudWatch Events. And CloudWatch Events lets me create a rule based on a schedule. So I can come in here and say, I want to do this every X minutes or X days or provide a cron expression. So maybe 10 in the morning, please do the following. And I can do things like um, EC2, I can stop an instance, I can reboot an instance. You know how there's always one machine that, that fails, but if you reboot it every day, it goes okay. You can automate that. Uh, you can terminate instance success trap. So this is a, 
one way you can schedule to turn things on and off. But I would also like to point you to a blog post that I wrote uh, not that long ago, uh, which is an EC2 stoppinator. I shall put this in the chat. So a stoppinator is the general term given to a, um, a program that can start and stop instances when you particularly like. And I created a couple of um, stoppinators and the, the code is available in GitHub. It's very, very simple under Lambda. And I have one of them that uh, allows you to automatically schedule. You can say, start, stop this instance at night and a script runs, say, 8 p.m. at night and turns off your instances. Uh, I have another one that you can say, um, hey, have this instance running for three hours and after it's run for three hours, please automatically turn it off. So you'll find a lot of these scripts out there um, that are called stoppinators and they can also be startinators. So yes, you, you can automate stopping and starting of your uh, EC2 instances, but uh, it might take a, bit, a little bit of configuration from you to define it and running some external utilities. I mentioned monitoring there. Let's pick an instance that I've got here, maybe a Windows instance that we launched. And down here you'll see there is a monitoring tab. And uh, we give you out of the box some monitoring of the instance. We can tell you the CPU utilization of the instance. We can uh, tell you about disk access. We can tell you about network access. Uh, the one thing we can't tell you about is how much RAM is used. And the reason for that is EC2 launches your virtual machine. We see the virtual CPU. We see what traffic goes in and out of the instance, but we can't see inside that instance. You're the only one with a password. Only you can log in and memory is assigned by your operating system. So if you want to be able to monitor memory usage, you'll have to run a little utility inside that instance to send the data out to CloudWatch. And we have that, it's called the uh, CloudWatch agent that can send that information out to you. Uh, also down here, you can create alarms. So I can say, for well, this particular uh, instance, I want you to maybe um, stop this instance when average CPU utilization is less than 5% for two consecutive periods of 15 minutes. So it basically says, hey, after half an hour, if that machine has been really quiet and not using much uh, CPU, I'm going to assume no one's using it. So it can stop the instance. So that's another handy way of saying uh, save money by turning things off. And that's called a CloudWatch alarm. Here you can see my CPU has dropped down below that. So if it stayed that way for 30 minutes, it would automatically stop. That was monitoring. Uh, oh, other things that I want to show you in uh, start, stop, terminate, etc. So if I point to an instance, I can come in here. Um, if I point to a stopped instance, I can come back in and I can say, please start again. And that again, is just like hitting the power button on a machine and the machine uh, boots up and it starts running again. If I no longer want a particular machine, maybe I um, don't want uh, this, I've already turned off this Windows machine, I can come in here and say terminate. And terminate means please turn off the machine. But once it's off, throw it away. I never want it again, remove it from this list. And after a half an hour or an hour, it'll disappear from this list and you cannot launch it again. So that's the great thing about AWS. You can launch machines and when you no longer want them, you can throw them away. Unlike the old days where you have this hardware sitting in your data center forever. Um, let's mention a few other things. Um, I want to point out some documentation. Uh, AWS has fantastic documentation. If you just search for AWS documentation, you will land on this documentation page. Put it there in chat. Uh, why does it sit there for a while, Brad's ask? Um, you can filter your instances up here. So if you don't want to see instances that are um, in the stop state, I oh know I can do it here. I can say state is running. So now it will just show me all of my running instances. So you can clean that up if you want. Why does it show for an hour or so? I've never known why. Maybe it's to give you the reassurance that yes, we've thrown away that machine and you can see it's been terminated and then it goes away. But if it annoys you, you can just filter it up here. You can filter by tags. So that department tag that I mentioned before. So just show me the instances that are running on finance. Uh, you can filter by the type of you know, operating system. Lots and lots of things you can do here in the console. Uh, Jelly points out after stopping and starting an instance, you will lose the ephemeral IP and instant storage. So to quickly explain what that means, when you launch an EC2 instance, and this is more for the 
networky folks, not so much for developers, you can say, please give me an IP address. If you're launching a public subnet, we can give you one automatically. That IP address, when you turn off your machine, is taken back. And so the next time when you turn it on again, you might get a different IP address. If that is annoying to you, because you want to always go back to the machine with the same IP address, you can get this thing called an elastic IP. An elastic IP is a static IP address that won't change. So you come in here and say, yes, please give me an address. Uh, IPv4 addresses are very, very rare in the world. There's not enough of them to go around. So we want you to use it carefully. So what we're saying here is, uh, by all means, use this public IP address. But if you ask for it and don't use it, we will actually charge you half a cent an hour for the pleasure of not using it. So it's our way of encouraging you to please use that thing. I can then associate that IP address with one of my instances, maybe my, uh, uh, my web server. And that web server will now always have the same IP address, even when it's turned off and back on again. Uh, you get by default five elastic IP addresses. You can ask for more if you want. You can even use them in your uh, uh, Route 53 to show you quickly. Uh, if you want to name machines and get to them without having to remember an IP address, you can use, do you say route or root? What do you think out there? You know, route 53, I, I've, I've trained myself to be American here in Australia, we normally say route 53. I have a domain name in route 53 that I call uh, jrclass.net, my initials, John Rotenstein. And inside of that, I have um, a number of domain name entries. And here's one I'll point out. Uh, ops.jrclass.net points to this IP address ending with 77. So remember that. If I go back into my list of Elastic IPs here, you'll see this one ending with 77. So it's my static IP address. I have associated that static IP address with my instance that I call ops. So you'll notice it's also got that 77. So I can theoretically connect to it just by saying uh, SSH uh, with my key pair, dot keys class pem, EC2 user at ops.jrclass.net. And it has logged me into that uh, instance. So it's a nice way of translating a domain name into a static IP address. Uh, Route 53, yeah, um, lots of our APIs are always updating. It's a fun thing in the cloud, isn't it, Jelly, how the UI keeps changing. So I was showing you um, some documentation. So a few things. If you're interested in learning more about uh, EC2 after this, I highly recommend you read the user guide for uh, either Linux or Windows, whichever is your preferred one. That gives the user-friendly version of showing you a lot of what I've shown you today. If you are interested in programming against it, so programmatically starting instances, stopping instances, etc., then we have the API reference that can tell you how to make API calls to AWS to change security group settings, etc. And uh, pricing is also worth mentioning. Pricing is always fun. And uh, with EC2, it gets even more confusing. <laughs> We have a number of different pricing models you might want out here. Uh, On-demand is the simplest. When you run it, you pay for it. When you turn it off, you don't pay for it. And uh, let's have a look at how that works. So uh, we've got our different operating systems here. So I might pick an instance type, maybe a nice big machine called a M5 Extra Large. Let's pick this one. It has four CPUs, 16 gigs of RAM, and in the region of, let's change to Sydney, since I'm in Sydney, it always shows US dollars, but the pricing is in um, US dollars. It always shows US dollars, but the pricing varies by region. So for that nice machine, I would pay 24 cents an hour to run that. Uh, that's Linux. If I was to change to Windows and have a look at that same machine type, it is 42.4 cents an hour. So uh, that includes the cost of the Windows operating system. So no need to true up your licenses, launch a Windows instance, we will bill you for that and you're fully legal. You might have also seen, I mentioned before, there are some uh, AMIs with uh, SQL Server installed on there already. And the price for that one then goes up to 90 cents. So actually half the cost of the machine is the cost of the, the database license that's included with that. We have many uh, database options for you. Uh, we'll talk about another show using our relational database service called Amazon RDS. So option one run on demand, just pay for it as you go, and then you can turn it off. 
Option number two, spot instances. We have, as we discussed before, lots of computers and they're always on waiting for you to use. And um, guess what? They cost us money to run. The air conditioning, the power, the, the beer for the sister admins that go around and, and maintain them. So uh, we don't want to lose money on these machines. We want to uh, try and earn money. So what we do is if we have some spare machines, we will offer them to you as spot instances. And you can save up to 90% on those machines. Let's give you an idea here. Here's some pricing coming up. I go back to Sydney. What was 24 cents for our normal instance? Uh, let's find our M5 extra large. So the normal price, that's odd, it's saying it's 25 cents an hour. Um, who knows? Uh, it's saying that currently the spot price is 7 cents. So I could launch an instance for only seven cents, which is a saving of what's a seven out of 25. That's uh 25. So that's about a 75% saving on that. Fantastic. What's the downside? Well, if we need the capacity, we can take those machines back from you. So with only two minutes notice, we'll go, oh, terribly sorry. We need some of those machines. We're turning it off. And in that two minutes notice, we, uh, your uh, application can quickly save some information or that, but basically it gets turned off. So do not use spot instances for your production workloads, or at least don't use it for all of your production workloads. Many companies enjoy mixing. They might have some on-demand instances guaranteed to always run, some spot instances, which they get super duper cheap, but um, might be turned off uh, if, if uh, AWS needs the capacity. So mix and match how you do these things. If you're just playing around with AWS, um, you spot instances, save yourself some money. Uh, it's, 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 it's a really great deal. And we don't take the machines back that often. I think I saw a stat that said 2% of instances we take back. There's a whole uh, methodology around spot instances that you might want to investigate and use. So it's a great way to save money. Uh, next EC2 pricing option is we have these things called savings plans and reserved instances. This is a way of saying, hey, I really like EC2. And I promise that I will use this machine a lot. Can you please give me a discount? And um, that's called a reserved instance when you say, I want that M5 extra large running in this region um, and I'm going to be running 10 of them and we will give you a lower cost for that uh, instance. We more recently introduced something called savings plan. And this is even simpler. It's a way of saying, hey, um, I expect to be running about $100 an hour of EC2. So can I please get a discount? We go, okay, if you promise to spend $100 an hour, we will give you a, a discount for it. We don't mind what sort of EC2, what instance type, where you run it, et cetera. We've got some different categories that go in there, but it's much more flexible and it gives you a, a pricing discount for running EC2, even between different regions. So between those two, you can save quite a bit of money for your consistently running things. We normally say save up to 75% by reserving an instance. Emily says, but for the spot instance, when your machine gets turned down, does the billing stop or do you get a replacement of another machine? So when a spot instance uh, is taken back by us, you first of all have a choice. Do you want to stop the instance, uh, which can be hibernating the instance, which means later on it can come back to life and continue from where it was, or we can terminate the instance, which means it gets thrown away and you can launch a new one later. So you have that choice. Um, yes, when we take back the instance for, for um, spot instances, we stop charging you for it. So don't worry, um, you only pay for the machine when you're actually using it. Um, you can actually mix and match things. So let's say there's a large demand for M5 machines and you're running an M5 instance under spot and we want to take it back. Um, oh dear. How do you prevent us taking away lots of your machines? And the simple answer is you use a variety of different machines. Maybe M5 extra large is in demand, but M5 four extra large is available or our newer generation M6 machines are available. And so we have this concept called a spot fleet. And the AWS spot fleet allows you to launch a mixture of different machines. It's a collection of spot instances and optionally on demand instances. And you can say, well, actually, let's give it a go. We're all about hands-on today. I can go in here and say, I would like a spot request. I can launch instances of the same size, good for running web servers. I can do flexible things, which means they might give me bigger and smaller machines. I might want to run something for a defined duration. You can actually come in and say, hey, I want to run spot, but I really need this job to run for four hours. I really don't want it killed. 
we will give you a price that's not as good as normal spot, but is a discount off normal if it is available. And we'll say, okay, we will guarantee you can have this spot instance for four hours after which it gets killed. I'm gonna come in here and say flexible workload. And this is where it comes in and it says, um, how much capacity do you need? I need some instances. I can choose what type of machines I want. So it might give me some M3 large, some M2 extra large, some C3s. It mixes and matches these different types of machines that are all generally around the same price. But if there's a big demand for M3 instances and that gets turned off, well, my M2s will still be running. My C3s will still be running. So it's a really great way to avoid having all of your spot instances turned off and we can automatically deploy that for you. You just tell us how many machines you want, approximately what um, power you want in terms of CPU or RAM, and we will manage that for you. Spot instances are great. Definitely, definitely play with uh, spot instances there. Fantastic. Um, how are we going here? About 10 minutes left. Um, roles, IP addresses, any questions out there? I will mention a few things about EBS if there's no people asking questions. So when I launch an instance, I nominate a disk volume that should go on my EC2 instance. So think of it as your C drive, D drive, etc. And um, you can automatically back up your EBS volumes. Emily has another question about Spot. When the machine gets taken back, do you choose to continue or do you need to reinstall everything? So if you hibernate your Spot instance, it will come back exactly the same. Just like a laptop, when you close the lid, it sort of saves information to disk. When it comes back again, it will continue running as is. But if you terminate a spot instance, uh, if you nominate them to be terminated, then you won't get the contents back again. So what typically people do is they launch a spot instance with that user data script that installs everything they want, and that machine can then do it. A good example is you might be having transactions coming in and thrown into an Amazon SQS queue. Our simple um, queue service allows you to put messages into a queue, then you might have worker machines that take messages from the queue and process it. Maybe someone is giving you a PDF file and you need to scan that PDF and pull out information and stick it into the accounting system. So uh, a great way to do that is to launch a whole lot of spot instances that go to the queue and say, do you have a PDF for me? And they process it, store it in the database. Now, if a spot instance died halfway through processing that, SQS can automatically give that message to another machine that is running. So a very good use case for spot instances is something that is doing sort of worker activities, pulling things in the background, and they don't mind if they get killed. You can then launch uh, another instance with that script in, installed through the user data and get it running again. Thank you for your question. Uh, disk volumes. So when you launch an EC2 instance, you can nominate what disk volumes you want on it, and you can attach multiple volumes. So let's say I was to go and launch a Windows instance, and I say, yes, thank you very much. And I jump to the storage section. So here I've got my root volume or my C drive. Windows are normally pretty big, so I could bump that up. Oh, no, not that big. I could then add another disk volume, which will come up as my um, D drive, for example. And I can say, oh, I'm going to store lots of data. I want to have 200 gigs of storage there. I can also come in here and nominate the type of disk. General purpose SSD is a good disk that runs uh, very well for your machine. and it's measured in terms of IOs, um, input outputs per second, which is basically the number of accesses you'll have on that disk. And the simple thing is, the bigger the disk, the faster it is on a general purpose SSD. So here, I've allocated a 60 gig disk and it's saying it will get 180 IOPS. If I'm doing a 200 gig disk, it's saying I'm getting 600 IOPS. So the bigger the disk, the faster it is, up to a maximum of 3000 IOPS, which is nice and fast. If you're running a database and you need really, really fast disk access, you can ask for a provisioned IOPS disk. And a provisioned IOPS, you tell us how fast you want the disk to be. You want it 10,000? Fantastic. You want it 20,000 IOPS? Great. We will provision that disk to run really, really fast. So great for disk intensive applications. We've also got the opposite. We've got disks that are available that are slower. They have uh, low IOPS, but they have guaranteed throughput. So sometimes you're processing really large amounts of information, let's say big data, and you're going through terabytes of information. Unlike a normal disk where you jump around the disk and you go, oh, I want this file, that file, that file. Um, a, a, a big data application normally wants to churn through lots and lots of data in one continuous go. 
And for that, throughput is more important than the ability to jump around the disk. So that's what we have here. Cold HDD are relatively low throughput. And we have throughput optimized ones. So here you can get um, you know, 50 meg per second churning through, which is really good for big data type applications. And we have our old magnetic, but we do not recommend you use that. So lots of different disk types for your application. So a lot of people say, how do I choose my instance size? How do I choose my disk type and all that? The simple answer is pick something and test. Is it running fast enough? Simulate your workload on the applications. You need more RAM, change your instance type. Um, I should quickly mention, you can do that. If you stop an instance, so here I have a machine that is a T2 small, and if I want it to be a different size, I can simply come in here and say, change instance type. And I can say, oh, I really need a faster machine. I'm gonna to change to a T2 large. And the next time I turn on that machine, it will have more RAM and more CPU. It's that simple to change things. So you don't have to get everything right up front. You can uh, play around and see. Mr. Bob says, um, the throughput optimized ones have a max, a minimum size. Oh, okay, so they've got to be bigger disks. Elusive no, knows. <laughs> is spot instance backed by EFS a common usage pattern? So EFS is another topic that we're not covering here. Uh, Elastic block store is your C drive, your D drive, etc. But it's attached to a machine just like a USB disk. You plug it into the machine and it's attached to that machine. Sometimes you want to share disk storage amongst many machines. So for that we have our Elastic file system. Uh, FS. So our Elastic file system is a NAS storage. So like your H drive you might have at work or things like that. Um, EFS is for Linux and we have um, another one for Windows, whose name escapes me. I'm sure Mr. Bob will probably point it out to me. Um, uh, EF, EF, FSX, FSX for Windows is what it's called. And the Elastic File System allows you to mount the same disk on multiple machines. So uh, the question here from Lucive knows, is spot instance backed by EFS a common usage pattern? So the clever thing there, that's a, that's a good point. If one instance gets thrown away, the the data that it's using can be kept on that network file system and other instances can grab that same thing. So um, I more often see EFS used with S3. So if an instance is doing some processing, it's finished its result, it can throw it to S3 that can then be accessible to an application. But if you need it on a disk, then EFS would be a great way for uh, lots of spot instances to share information. I want to do uh, one more thing with uh, I, um, EBS volume, so elastic block store volumes, your, your volumes that you plug in and store your data. How do you back up these volumes? So we have a thing called snapshots. So I can point to um, this disk volume from my web server and I say, I would like to create a backup, please. So I say, create a snapshot, uh, my backup. And I click create snapshot and it's that simple. What happens is behind the scenes, there is a snapshot being created. I just go in the snapshot and we'll see it being created here. And what it's doing is it's copying off all the contents of that disk so that at any time in the future, I can come back and say, please create me a new disk volume with a copy of the disk as it was at the time that made the snapshot. You can snapshot uh, every day if you want. And the snapshots are an incremental snapshot. So we only copy the data that has been changed. So you're not paying for a full backup each time. And the great thing about that is, um, before you do an update to your system, before you make a major change to the database, before you deploy your application, you can take a snapshot and if anything goes wrong, you can very easily restore it. Or a lot of people say to me, hey, I want to make a copy. Maybe I want to make a, a test system based off my production system. How can I do that? You can simply take a snapshot of your data disks and then launch a new machine with them. One thing I'll point out is a slight difference between AMIs and snapshots. So an AMI I mentioned is when you go to launch an EC2 instance, we say, please choose an AMI. An AMI is just an EBS snapshot with a little bit more information to say things like, oh, this is Linux, this has got SQL Server installed. But an AMI is actually just a disk snapshot with more information. And an AMI can also contain snapshots of multiple volumes. So uh, certainly um, do your snapshots. We also have something called a um, lifecycle manager that can automate, automate your snapshots. So you can come in here and say things like, oh, I would like my uh, disks to be backed up uh, every day, you know, every 12 hours or at this particular time. 
and retain the last you know three backups of your disk volume so no excuse not to do it i was on stack overflow the other day and somebody said oh i deleted a whole lot of files off my machine how do i get it back and the answer is if you didn't create a snapshot uh sorry you can't get it back just looking at what a few of you are saying here having a good chat fantastic so we have about hit the hour so i just want to compress as much as i could about ec2 in the hour um by no means have I covered everything that's available in EC2, but this should give you a bit of confidence in understanding how you can go ahead, launch an EC2 and just log into it, either via SSH or RDP. Um, if you are doing things with networking, you might want to ask your networking folks how you should configure it within there to keep your uh, security up and going, or you can join us again in a couple of weeks when we talk about uh, security on the 26th of August. Uh, thanks, Emily. Um, uh, so join us again next week. We'll be looking at Lambda. So Lambda is compute without having to run EC2. So if you've got something that maybe uh, as soon as somebody uploads an EC2 file, you want to copy it somewhere or scan it and retrieve information. You can trigger a Lambda function. It runs for even a fraction of a second. We just charge you for the number of 100 milliseconds that it runs. A really great concept of, of serverless compute. So we'll be covering off that uh, next week. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, keep on building, as we like to say in AWS. And um, I also invite you to join me tomorrow at around about, uh, in, so in 22 hours time, I'll be uh, doing my stream called AWS on Stack Overflow, where I go through Stack Overflow and answer lots of AWS questions. You're welcome to join in if you have any specific questions to ask, and we'll be happy to help you out. So thank you very much. And uh, developers, let's code. Cheers. Thanks, thanks Grumpy Dana. Uh, Emily, where is it, where is what? Where is the stream? The stream will be here on this Twitch channel on uh, twitch.tv slash AWS. See you, David. Uh, catch you off offline. See you, Mr. Bob. Please enjoy your day. Bye. <laughs>